want you to trust me for a minute and go on just a short trip. And we will transport ourselves to September or early October in New England. You're walking down a wonderful path. You might have your dog or you might have your special snookums with you as you walk. You start to notice, God, it's beautiful out here. And you start to look around and you see the magnificent colors. You see that nature is putting on a show just for you and your snookums or your dog. People come from all over the world to see the beauty of New England in autumn. They peep, they look, they stop, they take pictures. They are amazed at how nature is showing off its colors. Have you noticed that? That the thing that we crave most is this diversity in nature. And what I want to do here is say that we are a part of nature and a nature is a part of us. That we start to realize how connected we are to all that is and was in the world. And we realize that part of it is because things are diverse. Things are different. And it's the natural order of life. And we can accept that in nature, can't we? We take it in. We say, whoa, this is great. I doubt if the redwood, the majestic redwood, is bragging about how much beautiful it, more beautiful it is than a simple pine tree. So nature gets it, and we are part of nature. So today, I'm here to tell you a story. When I was a little girl, my sister Pat, and you would have to know Pat to understand why this story is, is pretty amazing. But my big sister Pat bought a book for me, and it was called The Emperor's New Clothes. I love that book. Again, I don't know if I love the book because Pat gave it to me and Pat is so amazing. Even until this day, I think she's amazing. But she bought me this book called The Emperor's New Clothes. And I used to love reading it and having it read to me. So today, people, I'm here to be that child in that story. If you don't know the story, the child pointed out something that was obvious. So I'm here to point out that obvious thing to hear you. I'm here to tell you that as humans, we've been fooled. We've been snookered. We've been bamboozled <laughs> into believing that difference is something that we should fear. That difference is something that we talk about division among us. That there are so many ways that we divide ourselves up based on characteristics that we hold, that we say some people are superior, some people are inferior, that we come up with all of these ideas around characteristics that people hold that's a part of their natural being, and we add value or devalue it. Again, remember that redwood and the pine tree? So again, we have to start to understand what are some of the lessons we can take from nature. How can we, since we are a part of nature, we're part of the natural order of life, how do we as humans understand how essential it is for us to value this thing called diversity? The other thing I want to tell you that that little child would tell you is that all of these things are socially constructed, AKA made up. <laughs> Those things are made up by humans to say that certain characteristics, certain assumptions, certain beliefs, certain uh, beliefs and assumptions and attitudes that we hold about people, it was made, it's basically made up. So when we talk about things like gender, when we talk about race, when we talk about class, even when we talk about ability, it's made up. And the little kid is saying, he ain't got on no clothes. That's my Louisiana talking. <laughs> So here I am today is to tell you that we have been snookered, we have been bamboozled, we have been fooled into believing this based on those social constructions. 
So one of the things that I often think about is this particular quote. If all of these things are socially constructed, then what comes of those social constructions? So like racism, classism, sexism, heterosexism. Those are the things that come up from something that is made up, okay? And as a result of those things being made up and us buying into them, it's limiting our capacity as humans to be as beautiful as that autumn day, to be as productive as that autumn day, to bring about the joy that people have as a result of that beautiful autumn day. And it took the vision of the child to point out the obvious. I remember the first time I realized I had been snookered and bamboozled. And I remember thinking, this must be the way Dorothy felt. And I don't mean Dorothy, my mother, because that was her name, but I mean Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, when it took Toto to pull back the curtain and reveal the truth. It took Toto to put, did you hear that, Toto? And Toto was a little bitty dog. <laughs> Toto was, as I call it, a little bite-sized dog, okay? So it took Toto to pull the curtain back and expose the truth. And then I started to realize I'm buying into a narrative that's a fantasy. And not only am I buying into this fantasy narrative, but I'm allowing it to rule everything that I do. The way I feel about myself, the way I feel about other people, the way I engage with my natural environment. And I said, no more. No more would I be willing to do this. No more would I be willing to allow other people to define me in a way that isn't consistent with who I am. And so now I'm on a journey. I'm on a mission to do the same with other people. I don't know how many of us it will take to say that we will no longer buy into the social constructions that we have been led to believe to be true. We're no longer buying into it. We are going to be like that redwood and say, I'm okay with that pine tree because we look good together. <laughs> no longer am I willing to buy into those things that is at the core of every movement that has led to the destruction of other humans, fear. I am no longer going to buy into constructions that people have of other people and give it to me and act out of my fear when I interact or engage with people who are, quote, different from myself. Because I know that some of the social constructions that are about me are not true. I know that they are nowhere near the core of who I am. And so what I have to do is believe that in others. And y'all, we are at a critical point in our culture. We are literally at a tipping point that more of us have to take the courage to engage in this type of understanding of one another, of being able to reach out to one another and feel as though we can create a world where we can embrace each other's diversity. See, again, nature. Nature has it down. Nature understands in order to be sustainable, we have to have diversity. Diversity of thoughts, diversity of ways of being, diversity of attitude, assumptions, beliefs, perspectives, the list goes on. Nature gets how important diversity is around sustainability, around growth, and most of all, around repair. We have some repairing to do based on the social constructions that we've created about one another. And I think we can do it. It is not too late for us to do this. When we think about all of the creative people just in this room, I bet we could probably do a variety of things that we never thought were possible if we were working together with those multiple voices being heard. And again, I'm not telling you something that I read about. I'm getting, I have a lot of boring slides with a lot of words on them. I'm telling you about something that I know to be true. 
that I feel it to be true, that when I'm truly interconnected and understand my interrelatedness with other people, I'm at my most productive and most creative. If we were continuing to do the things that we did 100 years ago, we would not have the innovation that we have now. It took that diversity of thought to say, what if we do it this way? Or what if we do it that way that was counter to what was, do, being, what was happening at the time? So that's about diversity. The diversity to me is the mother of innovation. I know the other things are the mother of innovation, but this is the real Dorothy, meaning my mother of innovation. Is this whole idea of diversity, the whole idea of thinking creatively, the whole idea of thinking of what uh, my colleague Michael Antonucci always says, is that I'll take compound solutions for these, compo for these complex issues we are dealing with today. And we cannot do that with a single mind. We cannot do that with a narrow way of thinking about this work. We have to come from it from a variety of ways. We have to have many people at the table. And there's room. We live with the illusion of scarcity. But if we work together, if we really understood the value of something greater than ourselves operating, if we really understood our connection to one another and our natural environment, Coming up with these compound solutions would be easy. I know this to be true because of environments where I have been in, where we didn't think we would make it, and it was that lone voice that said, have we tried this? And everybody's like, and it wasn't because you should have had a V8. For those of you. <laughs> so this whole idea about how do we do this is important. So I'm gonna give you three tips that I went through in order to do this for myself. The first one was self-reflection. I think that there's nothing greater than being able to reflect and to be able to understand what's operating. So when I first realized that I had been snookered, I had been bamboozled, what I did was I sat and I thought and I felt and I cried and I cheered and I celebrated as a result of understanding that. So I always tell people what came out of that was this, is that I was able to look at things that I had once been ashamed of, that I had engaged in some self-loathing about, and I was able to reframe it into something positive. So the slave narrative, for example, I had always been ashamed of that narrative. But out of this self-reflection came a lot of pride. And now I say to people, I'm a proud descendant of African slaves brought to this country. That's, that's what the self-reflection did, allowed for that to happen. So how do you engage in self-reflection that's deep enough for you to understand who you truly are? The second thing is, Whenever you're in a situation, you want to analyze and say, what perspective isn't being entertained? You always have to say, what perspective isn't entertained? If you would say, everybody else thinks the way I do, that's when you know you're going down the wrong path. OK? So that's the first sign you're going down the wrong path. But what you want to ask yourself is, what perspective is missing? And how might we creatively bring those perspectives to the table? The second, the last tip I had uh, is to realize how you're interconnected with others. And again, if you've heard my story, you could tell that that was part of what brought me to where I am now. I know that I am a part of everything and everyone. When I look out at you, I see a reflection of myself in each one of you. And therefore, it's harder for me to engage in separating or othering you, seeing you as the other. So this whole idea of how do I understand that I'm part of something greater than myself and an interrelatedness. Now, how many people will it take? I don't know. I don't know what's the critical mass that's necessary for us to shift the culture and to decrease the negative impact of those social constructs. But I do know we have to ask ourselves two questions. How do I blast past my illusion of separateness? That's one question you really have to answer. And the last thing is how do I reduce the amount of othering I engaged in since I know that I'm a part of you and you are a part of me? 
let's take our lead from nature, because isn't it magnificent? Thank you.